Hello, my name is Kishwani. That's K E S H W A N I Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for SAT. We have been solving SAT math problems out of this book here, the SAT Official Study Guide 2020. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Make sure you buy 2020 edition. Always make sure that the book is in front of you as we are doing the work. Today we'll solve some problems that you will find on page number 353. Turn to it. Page 353. The very first one is number 35. If at the end of the video you decide that this was helpful and you that you would like to work with me, that you would like to hire me as, a, as your tutor to, get, to help you get ready for the exam, you can get hold of me as always by sending me an email at Keshwani Prep. That's P-R-E-P, Keshwani Prep at iCloud.com. Alright? Let's take a look at this problem here. So we are given an equation here and we are told that the above equation has infinitely many solutions for x. Infinitely many solutions. Question, question is, if that were the case, if that's the case, that the equation has infinitely many solutions as they put it, in that case, what would the value of y have to be? This, this value of y. Given the fact that both a and b, we are told, are constant. So the very first question we need to ask ourselves is, what does it mean for an equation to have infinitely many solutions, as they put it? What does the equation have to look like for that to be true? We will take a couple of we'll we'll take a look at a couple of examples. The first example is very simple, very straightforward example, very simple example. The simplest that you can get, which is simple equation like this: x equals x. Well, if x equals x, then of course. Any value of x that you can put in here, 1, 2, 2,000, 2 million, half, negative 7, anything that you can come up with, obviously it will satisfy because the two sides are identical. An equation has infinitely many solutions when the two sides of the equations are exactly identical. That's the case here. Let's take a look at one more, another example, a little bit more, a little bit more sophisticated, okay? And what I want you to do, after I put the equation on the blackboard, after I finish putting the equation on the blackboard, what I want you to do is immediately pause the video and solve that equation yourself and see what happens. Here's the equation. It says 3 times 12x plus 11 equals 3 seventh of 84x plus 77. Go ahead, pause the video. I'll give you a couple of seconds to be able to pause and unpause the video and then solve the problem and then resume it and see what uh, and then we'll work on it together. Okay, so here we go. Let's begin, shall we? So first thing first, let's open this parenthesis here. 3 times 12 is 36. 36x plus 3 times 11 is 33. That's what we have on this side. Let's see what happens on that side. I'm going to work on that side down here because there is not enough room there. So it's 3 seventh of 84 x plus 3 seventh of 77. Now you may not recognize it but 87, 84, 84 is a multiple of 7. We'll see that in a second. If we divide top and bottom by 7, 7 will go away. How many 7 does 8 have? 8 has 1 7. 8 has 1 7. After we take away 7 from the 8, we have a remainder of 1. What happens to that 1? That 1 is going to go and join this 4 and become 14. And 14 has 2 7. 2 7 is a 14. And then we have 3 times 12. 3 times 12 is 30. Uh, 12 times 3 times 12 is 36x. And here on this side, the constant part, 3 7 times 77. Of course, 7 will go with 77 11 times. And 3 times 11 is. 33. What do, we, what do we know? This equation, obviously, has infinitely many solutions. Because it's identical. The two sides are exactly identical. You can put in any value of x and it will work. And the reason why any value of x will work here is because this equation that you're looking at is no different. It, believe it or not, is the exact same equation as this one. These two are exact same equation. You can very quickly prove it. Let's subtract 33 both from both sides. If you subtract 33 from both sides, this will drop out. And we'll have 36x equals 36x. And let's divide both sides by 36. Voila. It's just x equals x. 
So when the two sides of the equation are exactly identical, it will have infinitely many solutions because there is nothing to go by. You're not telling me anything new. You're just telling me x. There is somewhere uh, x. How much is it? Well, it could be anything. Because we're not told anything by simply uh, being told that y equals y. You get the idea. So here, that's what we have to do. We have to make, we have to understand that this side has to be identical, exactly identical to that side, if it is to have infinitely many solutions. Let's take a look at it. So we are given here ax times ab, ax times ab, and that would have to equal 4x plus 10. 4x plus 10. And if these two sides are identical, that means this a would have to equal 4. There you go. a equals 4. The question was how much is b? Well, we will figure that out in a second. And therefore, a times b would have to equal 10. If a times b equals 10, and we already know that a equals 4, we can figure out the b. And therefore, b equals 10 divided by 4, which is simply 5 halves. How much is b? The answer is 5 halves. And that's what you want to create in there, 5 over 2. That was number 35. And this equation has infinitely many solutions. When b, if b is exactly 5 halves, this equation will have infinitely many solutions. I don't know if I want to go into it, but if you want, if you want, we can quickly show actually, we can very quickly show actually that it, it will indeed have infinitely many solutions because A of course is 4 and if B, if B is 5 halves, then it's just 4 times 5 halves and this will go away. There you go, it's the exact same thing, 4x plus 10, 4x plus 10, it's the exact same thing. Number 36, next problem on the page. Next problem on the page says that, ah, oh, that's an interesting one. It says we have a line whose equation is y is equal to c. And we are told that this line intersects the parabola y is equal to negative x squared plus 5x at exactly one point. The question is, what is the value, what is the value of C? If that were to be true, if this line intersects this parabola at exactly one point, for that to be true, what's the value of C? Now the reason why they say it intersects parabola at exactly two spots, exactly one spot that is, exactly one point, is because typically when we have a parabola, it doesn't matter what it looks like, and if, you, if there's a line going through it, it typically crosses, crosses through two points, typically. But this time we have a situation, we don't know what the situation is, it could be anything, so I'm just going to draw a parabola. It doesn't matter where you put your axis, makes no difference where you put your axis. And we can show a couple of situations where the line will, line will intersect parabola at one point. It could, be, it could be a line like this, a line, simply vertical line going parallel to y-axis and will only intersect with parabola at one point. Or it could be a line like, a, perhaps a, a line like this. It's not, it's not exactly vertical but it can intersect at one point. Or perhaps a line like this, where this happens to be the, uh, the vertex of the parabola and it inter inter intersects there. So that's what we're looking at. And, that, and in those scenarios, we'll have one solution. The question is, what would C have to be for that to be true? So because they are intersecting, because the line and the parabolas are intersecting, then the, the point where they intersect, the coordinates of those points will have to satisfy this equation as well as this equation which means C would have to equal the value of Y wherever they intersect, wherever they intersect. There is a parabola and they're intersecting at one point, let's say, uh, let's say over here. At this point, the coordinate of X and coordinate of Y, of course, have to be same, which means the coordinate of Y here, which you see, has to equal, they have to equal each other, it has to equal this part right here. Let's bring the C to the other side. 
and we'll end up with x squared plus 5x minus c equals 0. Sometimes I end up explaining too much and I do this over and over again. Just multiply the entire equation by negative 1 because I don't like this negative in front of x squared. That's not a typical standard form of quadratic equation. So if we multiply the entire equation by, by negative 1, we'll end up with x squared minus 5x plus c is equal to 0. Now we have to pick up our story from the top. Now typically when we have a quadratic equation, typically when we have a quadratic, quadratic equations, we usually have two choices uh, to solve it. We can either use quadratic formula or we can factorize it. Well, we can factorize, we can do the factorization here because we don't know what c is. That's the whole point. We want to find out what the value of c is for this thing to be true. What does the value of c need to be for this equation to be true? In other words, this quantity minus that quantity plus c has to equal to zero. So we can use quadratic formula, or oh, we can use quad, uh, 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 factorization. So we have no choice but to use quadratic formula. And a quadratic formula goes something like this. Quadratic formula tells us that x has to equal minus b plus minus square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. Now what gives us two solutions typically is the fact that first we have negative b plus this quantity and then we have negative b minus this quantity. Both of them are by 2a. This is what generates the two solutions. If it has only one solution, if the system has only one solution, that implies if, if the system, and when I say system, I mean the system of two equations, the line and the parabola. If the system, if the system has only one solution, that implies that this quantity that we see under the root sign, b squared minus 4ac, must be zero. Must be zero. And this quantity that we just put down, b squared minus 4fc, actually has a name. It has a, it has a name. It is called, let's first write down here, b squared minus 4ac equals 0. It has a name. It is, it is called, I knew I was misspelling it, discriminant. It is what is known as a discriminant. As long as the discriminant is zero, in other words, as long as the quantity that appears underneath the root sign is zero, then the only solution that we end up with is negative b over 2a. And that's all. So if we set this equal to zero, we'll have the unique solution. Let's, let's continue. So we need, we need our equation. I, I, I forgot what the equation looks like. It's good to have the equation in front of us so we can see what a, b, and c are. That was the equation. This is negative x squared minus 5x plus c equals 0. So here's our a, this is 1 right here, this is our a, negative 5 is our b, and c is just c. Let's put them in here and see what happens, and we want to solve for c. So b squared would be negative 5, negative 5 squared, that's our b in this equation, minus 4, a is 1, times c, times c, has to equal 0. Negative 5 squared is just 25, so it's 25 minus 4c has to equal 0, which means 4c, which means 4c must equal 25, which means c must equal 25 over 4, and that's it, I believe. That's all. That's all we can go. And that's what you're going to grade in. So in the gradient problem, this is a gradient problem, they give us four spots to grid in. They give us four spots to grid in the answer. And we'll simply grid in 25 and then slash and then four. I don't know why I saw the need to explain that to you. Sometimes one wonders what goes through my mind. Let's do the next one, shall we? Number 37. You explain too much and things that are too simple to other people, it can drive them bananas. And God has given me the talent to do just that, to drive people bananas. Number 37 is very easy, very well it's not very easy, but what I meant to say is number number 37 is very straightforward, is what I meant to say. Number 37 is very straightforward. 
all they want us to do is to convert is to convert 200 miles per hour into feet per second. Oh, by the way, before I forget it, there's a problem, very similar problem, actually very, very similar problem to this one that you will find in my series. Basic Math, Day 80. Whenever you're searching for any mathematical concept and, and you would like to watch my work on it, it's always a good idea to put in my name along, along with everything else in the search. So obviously I'm not the only one doing this thing. There are probably thousands of other people. You'll get many, many hits. So just type in basic math in the, in the, search, uh, search, uh, in the search thing in, the, in YouTube. I know I'm getting, getting quite technical. Basic math, day 80, Keshwani. Watch that video where we do the exact same thing. Let's begin. So we simply, we, the question is actually very elaborate. I'm not going to read the whole bloody thing. Uh, and apparently some kind of falcon, some kind of falcon is, uh, is flying and we are told that its maximum speed is 200 miles per hour. And the question, question number 37 says, uh, what is the falcon's maximum speed in feet per second? Round to the nearest whole number. All right, so we're going to round to the nearest whole number. Let's begin our story, shall we? So we are told 200 miles, it goes 200 miles per hour, 200 miles in one hour. And our goal, we're going to continue our journey and our goal is to eventually have feet on the top and seconds on the bottom. So let's begin, let's begin. So first thing first, we need to first, we have to first get rid of this hour in the bottom. We're going to get rid of this hour from the bottom by having the hour on the top. And one hour we know is same as 60 minutes. So this quantity that we just wrote here, this quantity that we just wrote here is just one. It's just one. So if you multiply something by one, you're not changing anything. This is just one, one. Because one hour is equal to 60 minutes. Continue. There you go again. I did it again, explaining the bloody obvious. Now we have to get rid of the minute. So one minute we know equals 60 seconds. There you go. We have achieved the first part. We have the six, six seconds at the bottom. Now we have to get rid of the feet from the, we have to get rid of the miles from the top because we want feet on the top. So let's continue our journey. Oh man, I shouldn't have written this this big. I don't want to continue. To, let me, let me start again. Okay. And this time without explanation. So 20 miles per hour. One hour is 60 minutes. And one minute is 60 seconds. Voila, you see? It goes much faster if I don't babble. Now we have seconds at the bottom, we want to get rid of these miles, so we want mile on the bottom, one mile. And the problem tells us, you don't have to memorize this thing, problem tells us, in the problem they always tell you, whatever the change, rate of change, whatever the change factor is, that there are 5,280 feet, there are 5,280 feet in one mile. It says in the problem, this is not something we have to memorize. And that's all. Now we can take care of our units. We can take care of our units and you will see that things will drop out. An hour crosses out with this hour. This minute crosses out with that minute. And we have the second at the bottom. And this mile that we see here, let's put, it, let's put a triangle around it. This mile will cross out that mile. They will cross out. And what we are left with on the top is feet per second. All you have to do is reduce our numbers. All we have to do is reduce our numbers and we are done. So let's do that. So we have 200, 200 right here, times 5,280, which I'm going to write down like this. And you'll see in a second why I do that, because it makes the number smaller and makes it more manageable. Instead of writing it's 5,280, write it down as 500, 528 times 10. It's the same thing. And the bottom we have 60 times 60. 60 times 60. Let's begin our story, shall we? Let's begin our story and see what happens. First thing first, I see two zeros here, zero here, zero here, zero here, zero here. Let's divide top and bottom by 100. If we divide top and bottom by 100, two zeros are going to cancel out. I see a two and I see a six. Let's divide top and bottom by two. Six will become three. I see a six. 
I see a three here. The, this is a multiple of two. It's an even number. It's an even number. I see a six. Let's divide top and bottom by two again. Five has two twos. Two twos are four. Stay with me in the story, okay? Stay with me in the story. Pay attention. Five has five has two twos. Two twos are four. After we take away four from the five, you have a remainder of one. That one goes and joins the two, becomes a twelve, and twelve has six twos. And eight has four twos. One. That, that takes care of that thing, and th this three will go away. Oh, no, no, we just divided by 2 just now. Now let's divide by 3. And since it's getting too crowded from the top, I'm going to get rid of this top part so we have room to, to write down easily without getting too crowded. Now, let's do the second round. What we notice here is that 6 is a Just listen carefully. 6 is, six is divisible by 3, obviously. And 2 plus 4 is another 6, which means the sum of these digits is divisible. If the sum of the digits of a number is divisible by 3, the number itself is divisible by 3. So I'm going to divide top and bottom by 3. That's the multiple of 3. How many threes, how many threes does 2 have? 2 has no threes. 2 is too puny. 2, two is too puny to have any threes. What does he do? He, he goes and joins his neighbor. He says, I, look, I can't take on the 3 myself. Why don't we join together to beat the crap out of this guy? So now they become 26. 26 has how many threes? 26 has 6 threes. 6 threes are... 6 three, oh no, 23... Uh, 26 rather, 26 is 8 threes. 8 threes are 24. 8 threes are 24. After we take away 24 from 26, we have a remainder of 2. What happens to that 2? That 2 goes and joins the 4 and becomes a 24. And 24 has 8 threes again. Voila. And if you didn't follow me, I'm going to do it out the long way. So what we had was, what we had was 264. And we were dividing by 3. So let's start the story again. How many 3's does 2 have? 2 has no 3's. He's, he's too puny to have any 3's. Oh, what does he do? Well, he goes to his neighbor and says, Look, I'm too puny. I can't take on this guy. Why don't we gen gang up together to beat the crap out of this guy? Now, 26 and gave 3, 8 punches. 8 3's are 24. 8 3's are 24. After we take away 24 from the 26, what happens? We have a remainder of 2. What happens to the 2? That 2 goes, that 2 goes and joins the 4. That 2 goes and joins the 4 and become 24 again. And 24 can give another 8 punches to... to it's 88. Right there. That's it. Now 8 plus 8 is 16. It's not divisible by 3. But we're going to do it anyway. We're going to do it anyway. Pay attention again. So we're going to divide top and bottom by 3. 3. How many trees does 8 have? 8 has 2 trees. Watch what happens. 8 has 2 trees. 8 has 2 trees. 2 trees are 6. After we take away 6 from the 2, what happens? We have a remainder of 2. What happens to the 2? 2 goes and joins the 8 and becomes a 28. And 28 has 9 trees. 28 has 9 trees. 9 trees are 27. We have a remainder of 1. Well, what happens to that 1? Well, that 1 needs to be divided by 3. Because that's what we are doing. We are dividing it by 3. What do we end up with finally? We finally end up with 29 and 1 third times 10. Don't forget this 10. Times 10. 29 and 1 third and times 10 is 293. Voila. Technically, it is not 293. Technically, it's 293.3333 forever and ever, which is why they tell you to round it to the nearest integer. Do you understand? That's all. That's all there is. Now what I want to do is, now what we would like to do is, now what, what I would like to do is, do this thing one more time, and I'm just going to speak as I do what goes through my mind, but I'm not going to go in the explanation mode. Just do it with me again one more time with a pencil, okay? See how fast it goes. It's very simple. Divide top and bottom by 100. It goes away twice. It goes into 3. Let's divide by 3. 5. 5 has... Five. Oh, this time I'm doing it differently. You see, before we divided 5, 28 by 2, if you remember. There is no particular order. There is no particular sequence you have to go in. You can go in any way you want, as long as the math is correct. So before we divided 5, 28 by 2, if you remember, this, this time I, I inadvertently went a different route, which is okay. I'm dividing this number by 3. And how do we know that this number is divisible by 3? 
As long as the sum, S U M sum, of the digits of a number is divisible by 3, the number itself is divisible by 3. And I could tell immediately that this number is divisible by 3. Because 2 plus 8 is 10. 10 plus 5 is 15. 15 is divisible by 3, which is why I de decided to get rid of this 3 first. So let's do that. How many 3's does 5 have? 5 has 1 3. After we take away 3 from the 5, what happens? We have a remainder of 2. What happens to that 2? 2 goes and joins this 2 and becomes 22. And 22 has 7, 7 3's. 7 3's are 22 has 7, seven yes, yeah, 7 3's are 21. After we take away 21 from 22, we have a remainder of 1. 1 goes and joins the 8 and becomes 18. And 18 has 6 3's. See, this is what you have, this is what is required here. You have to be able to concentrate because otherwise since I'm speaking right now for a split second, I lost my concentration. Again, I notice here, well now we cannot, oh this is an even number. This is a 6, this is an even number. Let's divide top and bottom by 2. How many 2's does 1 have? 1 has no 2. What happens to that 1? 1 goes and joins 7 and becomes a 17. And 17 has 8 2's. 8 2's are 16. Well, after we take away 16 from the 17, we have a remainder of 1. That 1 goes and joins this 6 and becomes 16 one more time and it becomes 88 and that 3 goes away oh no that we were dividing by 2 just now that's which is which is why I got the 3 here we divided by 2 and now we have to divide 88 by 3 we can do it right here 88 divided by 3 and how many 3's does 88 have it's very easy we know we know 90 is made up of 33's if 90 is made up of 33's then 29 threes, 29 threes must be 87. Which is why 87 is divisible by 3 because 8 plus 7 is 15. So this is going to have, this is going to have 87, 88 is going to, we'll, we'll see in a second, it will have 29 threes with a remainder of 1. Let's, let's do that. Divide top and bottom by 3. How many threes does 8 have? 8 has 2 threes. 2 threes are 6. After we take away 6 from the 8, we have a remainder of 2. 2 goes and joins the 8 and becomes a 28 again. And 28 has 9 3's. 9 3's are 27. And we have a remainder of 1, which, has, which needs to be divided by 3. Voila. And times 10. Times 10. Which is going to give us, which is going to give us 293 and 1 third. Technically speaking. But 293 is what we need to grade in. Because they are looking for the whole number. Let's do 30. Let's do the last one, shall we? Thirty-eight. Thirty-eight says we we are dealing with the same falcon, same bloody falcon that we were dealing with in number thirty-seven. We still have to contend with him. 38 says that the falcon that we're dealing with dove at its maximum speed. And we know what its maximum speed is. Its maximum speed is 200 miles per hour. And yes, dove is the right word. Past tense of dive, past tense of dive is dove, not dived. Do you understand? Dove. And Falcon dove at its maximum speed for half a mile to catch a prey. So he's going to dive half a mile at the highest speed that he can muster, which is 200 miles per hour. And the question simply is, how many seconds would the dive would the dive take when you see when you see the prey down there he takes a dive and the dive lasts exactly half a mile from wherever he was in the sky he dives straight down half a mile at his maximum speed the question is how many seconds lap laps before he catches his prey how long the dive takes let's find out shall we we know we know he's going at 200 miles per hour 
200 miles in one hour. He can go 200 miles in one hour. That in, that in itself implies that he must be able to go one mile in one two hundredth of an hour. Makes sense, obviously. We don't want to go one mile, we just want to go half a mile. So that in turn must imply that he must be able to go half a mile in one four hundredth of an hour. All we have to do now is to convert this quantity, one four hundredth, into a second. Let's do it right here. One four hundredth of an hour. We want to get rid of the hours, we want the seconds on the top. So here's one hour. And how many seconds? How many seconds in an hour? It has 3600 seconds in one hour. One hour has 3600 seconds. Now we can see the hours are going to drop out and we'll end up with the seconds on the top and that's what we're looking for. It's, this one is very simple actually. Divide top and bottom by 100. Let's do it in a different color. Just to have some flair of the dramatics. Divide top and bottom by 100. This is going to go away. Divide top and bottom by 4. There you go. It will take 9 sweet seconds before he has the yummy morsel. I'll see you tomorrow, okay? So don't forget to send me an email if you want to get hold of me. Kishwani Prep at iCloud.com. Bye now.